Hi, I'm Kelly Vaughn and welcome to Inside Indy. And today on Inside Indy, we're going to talk about the journey of one man and his quest for a new kidney. Um, and um, his name is Jim Hester. And now Jim is, I wouldn't say famous, but very much famous <laughs> behind the scenes. But you were a videographer for many, many years. Many, with, many With years. Wish TV 8. That's right. Right. And, right. Uh, and I've, I've seen you many times out on uh, pr at press conferences and on photo shoots. Uh, yeah. and, and oftentimes, again, I'm sure you all have won many awards, and oftentimes you don't get the credit and the acclaim as some of the anchors and reporters well, do. Well, I appreciate you saying that, because without us, it's just radio. <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, in my yeah. book, that ain't a bad that, thing. Which isn't bad either, <laughs> but we're trying to do television. Yeah, right. I was a news photographer at Wish TV for 33 years. Wow. And I did primarily uh, politics. I worked with a guy named Jim Shella. And uh, we of traveled. Course, yes. Yeah, we traveled all over the country and did a lot of interesting stories. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was very unique. I mean, I didn't think I was going to like it, but the guy who normally did politics for the station was complaining about how bored he was. And at the time, I was operating a live truck, mm -hmm. and I was with reporters out on the out on the road, and with the weather and the cold. I said, "Hey, I'll trade you, I'll trade uh -huh, you," uh -huh. and we traded. And I did politics uh, from that moment on, and I really enjoyed it. And it was it was something different every day, and I I thought uh -huh. it really made a difference in people's life to be able to inform them, because uh, you expect them to make educated decisions about elections and different things. So I really felt it was a uh -huh. it was a gift. It, it was something that did the people good. A lot of news we get shot down a lot of times, but I felt we were really helping right, folks. Right. So what do you miss most about it? What do you miss I, most? I, I miss knowing what's going on. I mean, because I knew about things. You really knew about it. I really it. knew about it. I really <laughs> knew about it, and I knew about it two or three days before. So if they were going to do something, like, it, like for instance, the president's coming to town, or he's in town today. We would have known about it some time ago yeah. because the FBI would have checked our information and our name and all that sort of yeah. thing. So just being on the know, being on the inside track of, of things yeah. was kind of neat, I, I yeah. thought. Yeah. I think one of the coolest things about being uh, a news photographer is, um, uh, or a reporter for that matter, is you can go places where other people can't go. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the press pass got us everywhere and got yeah. us into a lot of different places. Yeah. But with that came a big responsibility mm -hmm. because you had to be unbiased. And that's really tough to do because we're human. We have views. We have agreements and disagreements with what politicians are saying or what folks mm -hmm. are saying. But we had to, you know, we had to get both sides of a story. And but that seems to have changed a lot, don't you think? Do you well, think there's a, because when I grew up, when I went to, to school for journalism, it was taught that you're, you are to be unbiased. And then I remember first time hearing the, that the Indianapolis Star was a Republican newspaper. And I thought, how, what? And then well, that's like 1984. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah, well, it was a Republican newspaper because the owners were, were, Repub right, right, were yeah, Republican. Right, right, yeah. But their point of view, though, they really did a good job of trying to, I think, I'm not here to defend the Indianapolis Star <laughs> news, or, well, it's not the news anymore. I'm not trying to defend them. Now you're really I, going back. I know. I, I, the Times, I can go way back. Yeah. But I thought there was really an effort to really be balanced. I mean, you really have to, in order to inform the people, you have to be Balanced. balanced, right, right. And, you know, I would listen to Rush Limbaugh, but I'd also listen to some uh -huh. of the more liberal folks uh -huh. just to get a, to see, you, see you what, where they are. Yeah. yeah so and as be. is the case with WIBC and the Rush Absolutely. Limbaugh. And I, but Jeff Simoleon, I believe, is a Democrat. Is a Democrat, that's Who right. owns it. So, but again, there was a point when I heard people refer, and even now you talk about Fox News versus CNN, but when I grew up, that didn't exist. That did not exist. And it's like, what is this? Yeah, yeah, that, that did not exist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah interesting. Yeah. So, now what do you think, and, and we are going to talk about your journey. Well, that's okay. And we <laughs> may right. end up doing a whole show. This yeah. is an interesting conversation. Yeah. So. Uh, what do you think about videographers? And am I saying the wrong thing when I say that? Well, news yeah, photographers. I, yeah, I, I was uh, less pretentious. I was a news photographer. News photographer. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's changed somewhat now, right? In terms of I, I, the last press conferences I had gone to, sometimes the news photographer was showing up and even asking the questions. That's right. They're, they're called one-man bands. Well, everybody is a news photographer nowadays. If you have a telephone, you're considered a news photographer. When I, when, before I left, folks were beginning to shoot tornado or, or disaster footage with their phone. And then they'd call the station and say, hey, I got 30 seconds of flames, or I have that accident that happened on 465, I have video of that. So they were taking it and using it. So, 
but we like to believe we're professional and we have a better way of, of editing and controlling, <laughs> right. controlling what, what goes on Not the air. Not to mention the $35,000 camera. That's yeah, right. There that's might right. be a slight difference. <laughs> but with the, with, with the one-man band, though, these kids are they're learning about, you know, I did the same thing when I was in school. We learned how to write and produce mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as be, you know, news photographers. My goal was not to be a news photographer. You know, uh, I really wanted to do radio. <laughs> I really wanted to do radio, but I really. What I were you going to do in radio? DJ? I was just going to be a DJ. Yeah, I did it for a while, and it drove me crazy. Four hours the same music over and over again. What station? Did um, you? It was here in Indiana. WRCR in Rushville, Indiana. Oh wow! A little yeah. FM station there, and I, I, uh, I just, I had a chance to do TV. I had an internship at Wish TV, 1977. Wow. Way back. I think I was still in. Still, you were still in grade <laughs> school or something. <laughs> But anyway, I had this internship, and after that, it was had to be TV from that moment really? on. Really, I loved it. Okay, I it's funny because it. I've been in, mostly in radio and now in TV. I think I I miss radio. It's yeah. funny, I, I, and I get television, but there's something about radio. Well, radio is it's very creative, and I think the transition from from radio to television is a lot easier because mm -hmm. radio folks they think on their feet. Mm -hmm. They're not doing a lot of reading. They're they're mm -hmm. going by the seat of their pants, and they. You don't want silence, so radio folks know how to keep talking and keep it going. Yeah. Keep keep it because you got another you got hour yeah. that show to go. You got to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Whereas TV, you kind of let that sound take a little bit and okay. different thing, and you depend on your photographer to save you. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk about your stories that you covered. Any that 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 to stick with you, things you remember. My my last year just covering the Obama campaign. Uh huh. Wonderful. There, there was a time in Denver, Colorado, when he was nominated at the Democratic National Convention. And he's there at the uh, Mile High Stadium. Uh -huh. And he's talking to the people. And I just took my camera down and I just watched him. Just no, not through the eyepiece. You know, I just watched. I just want to take that in as history. And I, I felt at that moment, boy, I'm in a great spot. I'm like probably 30 feet away from the guy and you cool. know, get, getting to see that. It was pretty cool. But I had a lot of really neat stories. I mean, uh, political stories. I think one of the more sad ones would be uh, Governor O'Bannon. When, when he died in office, mm. he had a stroke, and then he passed away in, there in Chicago, and they brought him back. I mean, that never, that's, that's always a political story, but it never really happens much, mm. you know, a state office holder, you know, passing away like that. So be able mm. to cover something like that and try to be responsible to the citizens because they want to know. They want to know what happened and, what, you know, they just, it's mm. just, you just want to know about those things. The same thing with yeah. Representative Carson, you know, when, when she passed away, when, oh, yeah. when she was yeah. in office. Yeah. But beyond sad things, there's always some great news stories. There were always fun mm -hmm. stories. Going to the mm -hmm. state fair, watching kids eat ice cream, get it all over their face and stuff like that. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you have a lot, lot of good stories. I mean, I'm, I'm six foot three, so majority of my stories with children, I had to get on my knees. I had to get down there with them. I okay. can't do it now, but I did it then. Okay. But you had to, you know, get down with them, you know, right. get down with and, the kids. Yeah. And it gets pretty emotional. TV's very powerful. Whoa, yeah, because yeah. that whole thing you mentioned looking through the lens at things versus standing there and absorbing it. So. It didn't seem real. In the eyepiece, is black and white TV. Ah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way I looked at it. I mean, sometimes there were some dangerous or gruesome things to look at. But when I shut that eye and I'm looking through the eyepiece, mm -hmm. it's, it's black and white and it's not mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. When you say gruesome, what did you see? Oh, just, just accidents and things like that. Oh, yeah. gosh, okay. And it's always interesting because the police and the first responders were always careful about covering things up. But before we got there, everything was wide open and every kid in the block got to see all yeah. that stuff. But when we're there, it's like, we're not going to put that on. Right. We're never going to. But you know, there was a time that they did, at least in the newspaper. Well, you remember that the Indianapolis Recorder years, my mom used to say that the, the newspapers back then, they would shoot pictures of things and they yeah. put it in the paper and it's, you know, it could be a shooting and the guy's there with the blood. Yeah. And, and at some point it changed. I don't know what I'm, happened I'm, in journalism. I'm thankful but. for that. I okay. just, I knew my parents <laughs> were going to be watching and I didn't want to hear about that. Okay. You know, I, I, just, I try to think about that my, my family's watching that. Mm -hmm. Would I want my mother or brother or sister or my wife mm -hmm. to see those things? No. So you had to shoot it in a creative way. And news photographers probably are some of the more creative guys out there because you want to be able to show it or tell it, but you don't want to show the gruesome. You don't have to show the puddle of blood. You don't have to show the broken bones and, and all that. So you do other things 
Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the way a story is con constructed in a television station, um, you're going out and as a news uh, photographer, you're shooting it, and then you take it back and edit it. Yes. And so, I, and I hate to say this, so the role of the reporter is, they're the stand-up. Well, is it what is well, it? Their their writing is also goes together with the editing. Okay. If they if they're talking about a red car, I probably ought to be showing a red car, but it's important for him to tell he or she to tell me we're going to talk about the red, <laughs> red car. car. So you can shoot. The yeah, red so car. I can shoot it. So okay. it goes together. <laughs> so don't talk about a blue car, you know. So. Um, but yeah, the photographer, we work together and we should always work together. We, the photographer should say, Hey, I, you know, I got a great beginning to this. It's really very simple. We make it difficult beginning, middle and end. Okay. You got to have a good beginning. That's going to grab them, get their attention. It might be with that sound. It might be okay. whatever, but something to, to get them. And then you get the middle, which is the meat, which is the telling okay. the story. And then the ending should be like the old movies, the cowboy going off into the, into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I never knew how that quite worked as in radio. You, you do everything. You, you write it. You, right. you anchor it. You do everything. You report it. Right. And television, and I've, I worked at Fox for a while as the assignment editor, mm -hmm. and I never mm -hmm. got into the actual producing as Putting a reporter. Together, so I, never, yeah. I could see them standing there like, why are they doing it together? Because I always did it myself. Right, Interesting, right. So. And it, caused, it causes problems. Okay. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody has their own way of starting it, but it's the reporter's name out there. They very seldom say, you know, the story's produced by Jim Hester or something like that. Uh -huh. It's, you know, to whoever say the guy's name yeah. at the end of it. So a lot of times I, I would say, hey, that's what you want. That's what I, that's what I'll go with. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back for the second segment okay. <laughs> that we said we weren't going to do, <laughs> we're going to talk about your journey and, okay. and, and getting your new kidney. Yes. All right? That's when great. we come back. And we're back here on Inside ND, and we're having uh, a very interesting conversation with Jim Hester, uh, who's a news photographer, former news photographer. And I feel like once a news photographer, always. Always, thank you. Know, you. It, it doesn't like just leave you. You know, I'm sure you think when you're watching sure news that you, you know, you, you you see what's not sometimes not being done right, but you. That's very true. You're you're engaged in whatever's <laughs> yeah. happening. So yeah. we were talking in the a previous break about big stories, 9/11. Yeah. Where were you? Uh, I was at a neighbor's house and we were talking and not really paying much attention to television. But then once we realized that there was a second plane involved, I said, I got to go. <laughs> I, I know it was going to be a big thing. Ooh. The reporter I normally work with was out of the country. And they were going to I knew they were going to need me there because I had some connections or we had connections there at the state house and that what the governor was going to do and all the things that happened after that. And a decision was made uh, later in the afternoon, in the day, that we were going to make a trip to New York. And uh, I, I asked, you know, when's the plane leaving? And of course, they had stopped all the, all the, all the <laughs> aviation no for the days that no, we're driving. So we we took us uh, about 13, 14 hours wow. to get there. And uh, we caught up with the uh, Fire One Rescue Group, the guys from Indiana mm -hmm. that go with the dogs and the. We caught up with them, and uh, they put us in the middle, kind of rocked us in their cradle, and that's the only way we got onto uh, Manhattan. Zoo. Yeah, wow. we got onto the island, but we were there for about five days, and it was an amazing week. Uh, I'll say this one thing, and I'll, I'll let it go, but people were walking by, and they were, at the time, they still thought their loved ones were alive in the building, so they took pic they had pictures, and they wanted to tape it on the side of our truck, just in case, so they could say... You know, we're looking for this guy. Right. If you see him, so by the time we left, our truck was plastered with wow. the pictures of of loved ones that, mm. of course, now we know that didn't survive. Right. But yeah. Uh, there was always that question, like, you know, what it, it, could somebody be alive, and are they on the lower level? Because at the time, just, yeah, I didn't realize it, but there's like four or five floors underneath ground level, and our yeah. interest even in going, Channel Eight decide to, is there an Indiana connection? We let the network do the big story. You know, they're mm -hmm. going to talk about mm -hmm. 
the numbers and the president and the home, homeland security and all that sort of thing. But was there some sort of Indiana connection? And we were lucky enough for those five days, we found, found a, a, girl, a lady who was a teacher from Indiana mm. and uh, just a lot of different. We, that hit, that was so, hit us to the core. It just, it, did. it didn't really, and that would be one time if there was an Indiana connection, because it was, we were so connected. We were so connected, yeah. 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 And yeah. but you like, just you, you just wonder you hung though. your flag, you know, yeah. it's like everybody. You, you just wonder. I mean, yeah. what? Wow. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. So you've had a kidney transplant. I had a kidney transplant a little uh, more than a year ago. I had uh, hypertension for a wow. long time, and that just uh, blew my kidneys out. And uh, can we? We're going to stop and watch a video. Sure about, uh, tells a little bit about your journey, and then when we come back, we'll find out more about the process and how you're doing now. Okay. So let's watch. The biggest difference I felt after surgery was the uh, energy level. It just went right, right through the roof. And I developed uh, hypertension, and the hypertension was so bad that my kidneys gave out, and I was on dialysis for a while. It was a full-time job, yeah, and I was just awful because you just wore out completely. I always considered myself a pretty good provider and taking care of my family and being with them, but I realized that when I wasn't healthy, I wasn't as good a provider as I could have been or wasn't as good of a father spending time, quality time with my family. I was so excited. I started crying. My wife cried. We prayed together. So I'm just trying to really take advantage of this great gift. I was released on, on Resurrection Day on Easter Sunday, one week later. So, I mean, that was just a, just a blessing. It was almost a, it was, it was a sign from God. Hi, Vanya. Hey. How are you today? I can just, uh, I can spend more time with my family, more quality time with them. I'm not just just sitting there, you know, looking at them. I, I can do things with them now, which is really great. I have uh, four grandbabies, and I, they chase me. I chase them. And we're we're doing well. Wow, what a fascinating story! And um, we'd like to know more about. You, how you got there and the recovery. You said you had hypertension? Yeah, it's sort of embarrassing about that. I didn't take care of myself. Uh, doctors, I'd go in for an annual physical, and the doctor would say, Jim, your blood pressure is kind of creeping up there a little bit. And I'd say, oh, great. You know, then he started giving me uh, medicine, mm -hmm. medicine for it. The more I took, the more it was really hurting my kidneys. I didn't realize that until later. The so, more medicine you took hurt yeah, your kidneys? Yeah, I, I think so. It just... Uh, it, it made me uh, urinate to get rid of the fluid off my system. And wow. in doing oh. that, it overworked the kidneys. Ah, gotcha. It overworked okay. the kidneys. Mm -hmm. so sometimes it's a diuretic that's built right, in that. That's right. A lot of that is diuretic. Wow. So it was a problem I should have taken care of a long time ago. So a little bit of obesity and hypertension, all that together with the stress of a, the job that I love just didn't, didn't go together well. Mm. Yeah. So when that happens, how do you know? I mean, I know your doctors are telling you something, but... What do you feel? How, what does it feel See, like? See, that's the, that's, the, that's the sadness. That's the terrible thing about, about hypertension. You don't feel it. If it hurt, people would jump on it and go right into the right. doctor and raise sand. <laughs> you get something done. It doesn't hurt. You never feel a thing. You just, your numbers keep going up. I mean, every time mm. they put the cuff on to take the blood pressure, you know, I was thinking, well, I feel pretty good. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, in fact, yeah, my numbers were pretty high. So, and that's, you recall what your numbers were? Oh, I, I, I'm afraid to say, I, I, I really don't remember. Okay. Yeah, I know them now, they're much better now. Okay, but, <laughs> we're uh, glad yeah. to hear that. <laughs> but they just weren't, weren't, weren't very good and they caused okay. me a lot of problems. So. Okay, so when the problems began, do you, do, what happens, do you feel sick or they tell you your kidneys are Yeah, your ki Yeah, you, they'll tell you that your kidneys are doing a certain percentage and that's, that's dangerous. My, my kidneys were, weren't, were producing like 15 to 10% of getting the urine out of my system. So I was being bloated. Then I started having problems. I had gout in my feet, you know. The acid, the, the kidneys flush all the bad stuff out of your system. 
And when it doesn't do that, then it backs up, and then you have a problem. Like I guess I had gout, and that was really painful. <laughs> that was that was really wow. tough. So it's and gradual. The, yeah, and then there's a number called the creatinine level, and then that was assigned to the doctor that we you know have to do something. So I was on dialysis for for a long time, four How and a half years. I was on uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis where you do it at home mm -hmm. for about a year and a half. That that didn't work because as big as I am, it, I was on it all day and half the night. It just didn't work very well. Wow. And then I was on what they call hemodialysis where you have a, two needles in your arm. One, the blood goes out of you, out of your body into the machine, cleans it up, and then puts it back in. But that's four and a half hours, three days a week. And wow. it's just not, it drains you. You didn't have much energy. Mm. So that's why the, the transplant was so good because I have so much more energy and I can enjoy my family, enjoy my wife and kids and I'm doing things again. And in the video, it, it shows about the being able to work again, being able to, my, uh, my family, my brother owns a courier service. So I'm able mm -hmm. to do some things and work nice. again. So nice. that's thankful. I'm thankful for that. Nice. So um, how easy or difficult is it to be the recipient of, of a kidney? It, it's pretty tough because you have to match somebody. You know, I'm, I'm a big guy, so I can't use a kidney from from you or somebody who's smaller, uh -huh. I can get a kidney that can be, be big enough to handle me uh -huh. and it has to, everything has to match. I mean, wow. it's, it's a great story. I'll tell it very quickly. But I was on dialysis for a total of four and a half years. Mm -hmm. I was on the list, on the waiting list, and I got a phone call at home on uh, Palm Sunday. And the lady said, Mr. Hester, we have a kidney for you. You need to come in this afternoon, later this evening to uh, match your blood and make sure this kidney is going to work. And it did. Wow. And I was on the table the next day wow. on, the, on that following Monday. And then I was released on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. So it's just, it's beautiful. Wow. And I have a lot of minister friends that say, you know, that'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> that'll preach. I mean, it's just a wonderful story. And it's just, I feel so good and so thankful to the Lord that he spared me to, to do something else with my life. He gave me another chance. I mean, people talk about second chances. This is a second chance that I have a kidney that's operating and working. So I'm, I'm, not I'm, I'm going to take advantage of it and do the best I can to help somebody else. And if I, hopefully with this show, I can tell somebody, mm -hmm. you know, take care of yourself while you can. You don't want to have to do this, mm -hmm. you know. When you say you didn't, and I know we've probably got just about a minute to go or two, when you said you didn't care, take care of yourself, what does that mean? Uh, probably overeating, uh, not mm. sleeping the way I should, mm. love salt, love salty food. All, all, all those things mm -hmm. combined is probably not, I mean, I, I'm no doctor, so I can't really say. But I mm -hmm. think when I think about it now, I'm eating healthier now and I'm, you know, no salt and all that kind of, I'm, right. I'm doing the things that I heard people say, heard doctors say, you know, I'll do this and, you know, leave yeah. that alone and all that, you know, if I'm doing yeah. it now and I. I feel better. I'm so, good. and you were at Indiana, Indiana University. University. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, doctor is a, a surgeon named Doctor Goggin. Excellent man. He's done over two thousand surgeries, two thousand transplants, in in wow. his time at IU. So he's he's really good at what he does. That I mean, would make me feel comfortable. That's right. That's right. <laughs> two thousand. That's a good number. That's a good number. I was <laughs> I was courted by a couple hospitals in in the area. Really. So okay. yeah, everybody's trying to you know. And I said, well, who, who's doing the most? And it was, it was IU, so I, I settled with them. Do you know whose kidney you have? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's been a year, a little more than a year. And uh, they asked us not to get in touch with the donor's family. I have a, a cadaver donor. This young person uh, passed away. Hmm. I want to get in touch with him. I, I want it I with his family, but I haven't done that. And my daughter kind of helped me with that. She says... It's an anniversary for them too. Their mm -hmm. loved one passed away. Yeah. So I should probably wait. I'm, I've started the letter and stopped and started and stopped. Okay. But I, so someone, a part of someone lives inside of you. That's amazing. Absolutely. And I'm thankful. Very grateful. Okay. Well, we're grateful that you came by to share your story. Sure. And I appreciate you coming in. And it was, I just, was just a, a pure joy having you here well, and hearing uh, your story, what you've been through as a news uh, photographer, and then your journey as a... Uh, uh, recipient of a kidney, and, and you've taught us all so much, um, and hopefully our audience will heed to some of this advice. Absolutely. I moi so. included. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. okay, Jim Hester, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's here fun. on Inside Indy, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.